What is up humans of the cardboard? Welcome back to Just Nuts guys. Today we are doing a top 10 video. This time I'm looking at the top 10 cards released in 2021 in Yu-Gi-Oh. This is going to get kind of crazy. Um, there's a couple presets I want to I want to establish before we get into uh, the actual list itself. A lot of archetypal cards didn't make it into this list just because they're they're archetypal, right? If you're looking at top 10 overall cards, you're you're going to tend to see a lot more generic cards that end up on this list because they just have more applications across the board, not just one deck that's in the meta for two or three formats and then it's done, right? I'm not looking for the top five most impactful cards of the of this year specifically, right? Because then we get into Drytron territory. We can start talking about, you know, uh, Sword Soul territory towards the end of the year and other stuff like that, Trivergate stuff, you know, wh whatever. I don't want to get into all that stuff. That's not really the point of this list. We're looking at the top 10 cards though released in 2021 so without further ado let's jump into it starting off with number 10 we have lina the light charmer lustrous um, we have all the elementals for the charmers and they're fine but they're a little bit more specific whereas lina starts getting us in a territory of like this can almost work in any given matchup because anybody could be playing valor anybody could be playing a generic link monster that is light that just they just need to go up through they play gamma and they they're, they're able to link it off or get it off any of those off the field those are lights like anything like that generically lina can come up so much more easily um than other once and i'm gonna be honest i'm gonna the, if i do a list at the end of 2022 the dark charmer will definitely be on that list but even higher than number 10 i guarantee you that because that card's crazy because then you start getting into reborning verte anaconda if it's still around reborning uh dpe dragoons once they're in grave right like insane insane interactions this card can't quite get that powerful unless we're in a format where like konami makes more good light boss monsters but still this card is definitely crazy for being a generic link too Next up here, we have Cupid Pitch. This one could have easily been number 10, could have honestly been bumped from the list, but I do have faith in this card going forward. I know it didn't do a ton in 2021, but that's not the point of this list, is not who had the most impact in 2021, it's just how good are the cards. I think this card will come through. I think at some point, maybe it's a ban list that kills everything else and everybody starts pivoting into more Hauk centric decks again, and Cupid Pitch is the best way to like have really crazy Hauk combos. I think it'll come through again, whether it's a specific deck or a couple of specific synchro based decks or a Hulk deck specifically. Um, I think Cupid Pitch will come through as a crazy generic uh, synchro four that just gives you free resource. So, gotta love it. Next up here is Ready Fusion. Just as a generic extender, I get it's not the most powerful extender and the fact that it only reborns vanillas or summons vanillas out of the extra deck. Um, but I do think there are just so many decks that just needed a card like this, something where it's an extender, but it doesn't require you to play a brick in your deck. There's a lot of engines like that, right? Where it's like three starters, like your, your quick launches, but you have to play rocket tracers. And if you don't want to have to play those tracer kind of bricky cards, Ready Fusion's there. It's in the extra deck though, so you have to be playing a deck that can't afford to, you know, allocate one or two slots to uh, Ready Fusion targets, so just be aware of that. But other than that, I, I just think it, it helps a lot of decks. There really are a handful of decks that get a nice little uh, assist from this this card. Uh, then we get to number seven, I believe. I think it is seven. Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. Again, this is another one that probably you know didn't see a ton of impact in this year, but I think I think it's still a card that's definitely worth noting. Um, on paper, this card is crazy, right? This gives decks a way to out um, a towers type monster without having to play a kaiju and hard draw it or any of that stuff. As long as you can kind of spam the board and you only need to put four link materials worth of uh, on the field because then you'll be able to just rip your opponents off uh, as one of the materials. And then this card's kind of a house when it hits the field. On summon, it, uh, it blanket negates all monsters your opponent controls and then it's unaffected by non-targeting effects so that's actually a problem some decks have like only non-targeting effects specifically and then this card can also negate an effect that special summons a monster from the graveyard that's a lot of decks recursions that's a dpe if you use this card you can trick your opponent into not firing their dpe so that you can uh, hit them with this and now dp can't come back when he uses his effect like if he uses effect at some point 
um, is crazy, so crazy. So uh, definitely think this card is kind of crazy. It has like four different effects. They're all solid and you gotta respect it. You definitely have to respect this card for sure. I think at some point it could be a staple in a specific meta deck that's good at spamming the board, but also has a trouble dealing with those towers type monsters. Uh, oh, whoops, my bad, my bad. Uh, next up here, we have Diviner of the Herald. This is number six. Uh, this card, we know about Diviner of the Herald. The reason I like this card, you might be like, John, this is just Drytron support. I'm like, yes, it's Drytron support, but people don't realize how many decks this like really, really helps. This helps so many decks. The Agent deck this is playable in, the uh, even Super Quanals. This is, a, this is like a one card combo for them uh, because it summons any fairy right out of the deck and it can just summon the fairy Alphin straight out of the deck. Uh, when if you contribute it and this card can search a card that tributes it so in trius hierarchia so not a problem uh, i just think this card's crazy it's it's going to be a generic help to um ritual decks it's going to be a generic help to um other decks as well and i just think at some point uh this card may get hit because it's just going to be too much too generically applicable to like multiple decks being like their best starter and i was going to be like this is too much this card's being played and everything we need to take care of it which takes us to number five, Cross Out Designator. Uh, I don't love this card personally, but I do still respect this card for what it is. If you're ever in a mirror match, this card is insane, which makes me think like if I'm ever playing a top three deck in the game and I'm going to a bigger tournament expecting to play a decent amount of mirrors, I'm probably just siding this card. If I'm in that mirror, this is like probably the best side deck card ever, right? It's an insane interruption because it's an Omni Negate versus any one of their engine cards and even potentially tech cards. And it's a it's a fucking uh, insane card going second to help you play into boards, right? You already play the same cards uh, that they're playing and like you could just negate it. Negate something like a blackout, you know, playing into a board is kind of crazy and stuff like that. So the applications of this card are insane. Obviously there are generic applications as well. I don't love it as much playing it in the main deck because it definitely can whiff depending on the deck you're playing against. But I do think as specifically a side deck card, like this card has insane value and you have to respect it that it's like around. Which takes us to number four. We've got F-Zero Utopic Draco Future. The card's crazy. A couple of different decks can make it. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Like I know right now, mainly it's like the Leerless Tribrigade deck, uh, as well as I guess Sharks, that deck is kind of floating around and they can make this card fairly easily. Uh, but there'll be other decks too. I mean, it'll happen. I guarantee you that um so definitely got to respect it even uh even zodiac especially if they could drive him back like this card becomes a lot more interesting for them um which takes us to number three baron de fleur yeah there's just i mean honestly there's not much to say about him monster negate can potentially steal it uh and he can't be destroyed by valor card effects he is a house to deal with uh and then you get to baron de fleur this card's crazy this card could have been higher on the list but the last two cards are like whoo, power creep at their finest uh but yeah baron de fleur um, we, we, we went crazy when Borload Savage came out, but the difference there is Savage at least needs setup. You have to put a link in grave before you even go into him to make sure he has any value. This card, as soon as it hits the field, is an Omni Negate. It's so crazy. I know it's a level 10, so it's a little bit harder to make than a level 8 for a lot of decks, but still, just the fact that as soon as this card hits the field, even playing second, a lot of decks are taking advantage of this card because going second if you could just make this card as early as possible you now have at least a negate to help you play through whatever interruptions your opponent's got set up for you and that's crazy let alone the omni negate going first and follow-up that this card presents it's insane this card's really crazy it deserves to be number three it should be number three i wish i had one <laughs> Which takes us to number two, Pot of Prosperity. Yes, Prosperity came out in 2021, very early 2021. In fact, the first core set. In fact, it's, I think, other than Underworld Goddess, the only card of note from all of Blazing Vortex, which is insane because that's a whole core set. <laughs> but this card's crazy. It just power creeps all the pots we've had before other than, obviously, regular Pot of Greed. We had Extravagance, but this card allows you to still play a deck that works an extra deck, but just doesn't need literally everything in it so that you can still work around with this card. This card is also one of the big reasons why stuff like Imperial Order and Anti-Spell Fragrance are being complained about so much right now is because if, as long as you already have a hand that plays, then your Pot of Prosperity now is just a card that helps you dig for like an insanely nasty floodgate like those cards and you could just outright win the duel because of it and that's that's crazy that's totally insane so uh this card definitely deserves to be on here insane consistency piece insane utility piece digging for whatever you may need sorry if i sound rough i am uh coming off of some sickness 
And, but yeah, prosperity number two, taking us to our number one. Of course, it's DPE. It has to be DPE. I'm sorry. I think this card's better than Dragoon overall, right? I'm not saying that like in a vacuum, once they both hit the field facing each other, I think Dragoon wins that fight more times than not. But I think over in terms of consistency, being able to play Fusion Destiny as a three of insane extender in your deck, not just or a red eyes fusion, which a lot of times, even if you draw, you don't want to activate because it means the rest of your hand is dead as far as engine pieces go, because you cannot summon for the rest of the turn. And or for the for other than that, the entire turn. And yeah, and also you have the potential draw two later on. The recursion of this card is crazy. Like, seriously, like I think this card is is like insane. Uh, we're probably like we have a ban list in January. Konami's definitely not gonna hit it then, it's still too new. Maybe after that they'll think about hitting something, maybe at least Verte, so that you can't just make this guy with a link two, but you could still splash the fusion destiny, you know, spell and hopefully see it. But at that point you're playing three insane like insane power cards with two rough bricks. Is that really fully worth? Probably, <laughs> honestly, but like we'll have to see. But this card's insane. It's the best boss monster we've seen in a while. Hit it. Dragoon's the only thing that really rivals it in like in terms of accessibility plus power, right? And so yeah, this card's definitely number one. I don't think anybody's really gonna argue me on that. But that is it for our top ten video for today. So let me know in the comment section your thoughts. What is your top ten list look like? Do you think some like uh, archetypal cards still deserve to be in here, even though they are archetypal cards and they only support really one or two decks? Let me know in the comment section down below. How would your list change? What do you disagree with? What do you agree with? All that shiz. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you have not yet. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.